now that Peter has arrived. <laughs> Is it on? Yeah. Now that Peter's arrived, we can start. It's with great pleasure today that I introduce um, Professor David Tolovey, um, who I've known, had the pleasure of known for many years. Um, as you hear from his accent or from his name, David is a native of Scotland, actually from Edinburgh. There he, there he was born and grew up. He did his undergraduate in Edinburgh and then went down to Cambridge where he did his PhD in Professor Arts Lab in, um, in, in, on genetics. After that, he went to the US to Christina Godfrey's lab and he began working on RNA processing. And he's remained working in this field for many years and has had many seminal papers. After leaving um, Christine's lab, he came back and went to, sorry, he came to the, after leaving Christine's lab, <laughs> there's one seat here. <laughs> After leaving Christine's lab, he then got a position at Pasteur Institute in Paris and then went on to the EMBL where he was a group leader for many years. In 1997, he left the EMBL and went back to his native Edinburgh um, as a welcome senior investigator fellow. Is that right? Principal Research Fellow, I'm sorry to hear that. And he's had this funding ever since, which is quite remarkable in the current state of funding in the UK. He became um, head of the Welcome Center in 2011. And um, thank you very much, David, for coming here today. Thank you. Well, yes, thank you very much. Thank, thanks very much for the uh, invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, so I, I was, it was suggested to me that it would be good to sort of start with a, a sort of how I came to be here type introduction. So I'll, I'll do that. A bit overlapping with what Mary's just told you. So I went to university in Edinburgh to do physics, actually, but then changed um, from physics to biology during my first year. The fact that there were, in my physics class, 98 men and one woman may have been a factor in picking <laughs> biology. Um, but I ended up doing microbiology, which at that time was based in the College of Agriculture at King's Buildings. And there I became really interested in microbial genetics, particularly fungal genetics. And so for my, um, for, uh, for my PhD, I went to uh, the genetics department in Cambridge where I did uh, classic genetics. Mendel would have been uh, proud, crosses and all that, you know, Mendelian inheritance. And actually, if you look really closely, uh, Aspergillus looks a little bit like peas, I feel. <laughs> it's the spores. Um, and so, but in those days... Um, Fungal molecular biology hadn't really taken off. It was just starting to get going in Neurospora, but the, the premier fungal genetic system was, uh, was budding yeast. And so I was keen to do uh, a, P, a postdoc using uh, yeast molecular genetics. And for that, I went to the University of California in San Francisco to the laboratory of Christine Guthrie, which is just here in the Parnassus campus, lovely spot overlooking the Pacific Ocean. And my apartment was just there. <laughs> um, I had a great time there. Um, and so there the project was molecular genetic characterization of small nuclear RNAs in budding yeast. And in fact, all the work I'm going to tell you about is in budding yeast. Uh, my group has applied the techniques that we've developed in pathogenic fungi and viral infected human cells uh, and mouse cells and other uh, eukaryotic systems. But the stuff I'm talking about today is, is, will be yeast stuff. But the basic principles of molecular genetics... Um, the basic principles of RNA biology are really well conserved between yeast uh, and higher eukaryotes, including humans. And, and we like to think that all the stuff that we're, much of the stuff that we're learning in yeast will be more or less directly applicable to other systems where, where it's less tractable, in human, including humans. Um, and of course, yeast is, is haploid, it's evenly manipulated by molecular biology techniques, and so of course it's quite unlike peas. So the project was to characterize small RNAs in yeast. At that time, the US in RNAs had been identified. And, and the, in, in a really insightful paper, uh, John Stites and others had proposed that small nuclear RNAs functioned in pre-mRNA splicing. And so my project was to identify small nuclear RNAs in yeast and show that they're test whether they were or not involved in splicing. But when I started looking at this, this is in vivo labeled small RNAs in yeast. This is my 
My, my first ever work with, with um, radioactivity in Chrissy's lab was, um, I'd never worked with, I'd never done genetics before. And she said, well, we do labelings. And we you normally either use 40 or 50 millicurie labellings. As you've never worked with radioactivity to date before, we'll just do 40 millicurie labelling. Uh, and it's a sort of baptism of fire with radioactivity. But we identified all these small RNAs. And we showed, I showed that the genes were essential it's only non-essential and single copy, so you could actually do genetics with them. Uh, and CAP-specific labeling, so there was a whole bunch of these small capped RNAs, but I had a lot of trouble at, um, making them correspond to the spisosomal SNRNAs that we were looking for. Um, but we published that, uh, and I moved on. I went to uh, Institute Pasteur in Paris as a chargé de recherche, as a permanent staff position. Um, and I carried on working with um, these small RNAs in my own lab. And when I was there, what we discovered was that, in fact, these weren't small nuclear RNAs. In fact, yeast service has small nuclear RNAs, but these weren't them. Uh, and, in fact, these turned out to be small nucleolar RNAs. And we showed that they were um, localized to the nucleolus and base pair to the periribosomal RNA, and we showed that some of them were required for periribosomal RNA processing. And we also showed that there was a, a similarly high unexpectedly high complexity of small capped RNAs in filamentous fungi uh, and human cells and in pea plants. We grew the peas on the, on the lab windowsill. And years later, actually, someone came up to me and said, oh, Tavi, I know that name. Oh, yeah, you work on peas, don't you? And so, you know, so I said, well, only tangentially. And so what this showed was that eukaryotes had a really, really surprisingly large number of small nuclear or localized RNAs that function in ribosome synthesis. Um, after about four years at Pasteur, uh, I moved on again, and I went to the EMBL in Heidelberg as a group leader. And so, then we, and so based on, on our discovery of all these nucleolar RNAs, the focus of the lab then became ribosome synthesis. It's a great topic, um, but, but it has problems. Well, there are has features of interest and, and difficulties. And so it's incredibly expensive in cellular terms. In a yeast growing, a fast growing yeast cell makes 2,000 ribosomes a minute, so 160,000 ribosomal proteins, megabases of ribosomal RNA, and it's a huge component of the total transcription budget, the energy budget of a cell, and probably because of that, both control. Um, but it's also inordinately complex. Um, we, we really hadn't appreciated when we started just how complex it is. Each pre-ribosomal RNA molecule will associate with more than 200 different proteins, plus the 75 ribosomal proteins, and 75 different small nucleolar RNAs. You know, every one of these will base pair to the pre-ribosomal RNA during the five minutes it takes to make a yeast ribosome. So it's, it's a spectacularly complex pathway. Most of them direct ribosomal RNA modification. A small number are involved in, are involved in processing of the pre-ribosomal RNA. And in fact, we're still working on these small nuclear RNAs. We've come back to them. We now know that the, that the, the ones that guide modification also bind to other RNAs, including messenger RNAs, both in yeast and human cells. And they've been implicated in cancer and, and growth control. But I'm actually not going to talk more about those just now. Uh, it's also very difficult to study in detail. The, the pathway is um, very complex. Well, there's huge numbers of factors. There's very large numbers of intermediates. And in, in the 1990s, we had, no, we had very little way to get beyond superficial phenotypes. We could knock out individual components of the periribosomal RNA, of periribosomal particles, and what would happen is the periribosomes would disappear. And we now know, of course, that that was because the nuclear surveillance activities are extremely active, and they very quickly identify partially assembled periribosomal RNAs as targets and degrade them. But it means you couldn't accumulate defective periribosomes to study. And so by the mid-1990s, we'd identified quite a large number of proteins and RNAs, but we actually knew the functions of almost none of them. And so we decided that what we would try to do was to find enzymes involved in the processing, because you've got an enzyme, you can do biochemistry, you can make it work in vitro... And so I did a, a classic um, yeast experiment. I screened a bank of TS lethal mutants for and I, and it was one of the last experiments I did myself. Um, I, I screened a bank of TS mutants and, and um, looking for mutations that specifically interact, that disrupted specific steps in the processing pathway. 
This was really successful. Identified um, POP1, which is the first eukaryotic component of RNAs P and MRPs. These are RNA protein complexes that function as endonucleases. And it also identified what we call RRP44, um, which then turned out to be the first protein component of the exosome nuclease complex. And then I moved on at this point. I might, actually, I, did, I, I, I was on a top nine year contract at EMBO, um, the standard group leader contract. As that was coming to an end. And so I moved to Edinburgh to the um, Michael Swan building, which had just been built in those days. Uh, and it's, this house. This house is then as now the Wellcome Trust Centre for Cell Biology, and this is the director's golf course. Um, <laughs> and so, the topic of the focus of our work in Edinburgh has been we continue to work on ribosome synthesis, but because of identifying the exosome complex, our, our interests have now sp are then spread out to RNA processing and surveillance more generally. Um, and indeed, we were just saying that I've actually, actually just started my third ten-year grant from the Wellcome Trust, and every one of them has been called Nuclear RNA Processing and Surveillance. So these are our aims that remain constant, though showing a sad lack of ambition, perhaps. Um, the nuclear exosome has, has a big range of functions. So, so it functions, the nuclear and cytoplasmic complexes. The cytoplasmic complexes function in various um, cytoplasmic turnover pathways, mRNA turnover, non mediated decay, no-go decay, various um, such... Um, translation-linked surveillance pathways. Um, but I'm going to talk today about the nuclear function of the exosome. So it's involved in the accurate three-prime processing of a wide range of stable RNAs. It's involved in surveillance and degradation of RNAs and RNA protein complexes with many different kinds of defects, uh, including splicing, termination, polydenylation defects, and messenger RNA precursors. And it's involved in the clearance of multiple kinds of RNAs that don't encode proteins. Um, work by many groups, but particularly the Conte and, and Lima groups, ha have identified the basic structure of the exosome as, as this, this barrel-shaped structure in which, remarkably, around 33 nucleotides of RNA are threaded through the lumen of the complex down to the active site of an exonuclease called RP44 or DIS3. Um, but in addition, the, the complex can undergo a conformational shift, which breaks this pathway through the middle of the complex, this channel through the middle, but act, opens up a pathway that would lead directly to the exonuclease site of this enzyme. There's also an exonuclease in another component, and there's an endonuclease in, in also in RP44. So exonucleases are enzymes that will chew the RNA from one end to the other, in the case of the exosome, always in the three prime to the five prime, whereas the endonuclease will cleave RNAs. And for those who are, who are keen on this sort of thing, this is a pin domain metal catalyzed endonuclease. There's been a lot of work, a huge amount of work, um, on, on the structure of the exosome with a, a and I second to no one in my enthusiasm for the exosome, but there's been a really surprising number of nature papers about the structure of the exosome as it's, as it's developed over the years. But it's been much more difficult to work out what's actually happening in vivo. So you, in vitro, we can see these structures, but the, this huge range of substrates in vivo um, are much more difficult to attribute to different active sites and pathways. And so I'm not going to share much about this, but we've been recently... Um, Looking at this, and this was published um, about four weeks ago, three, four weeks ago. Um, but we've been trying to work out that the way that different kinds of substrates show preferences for different routes through the exosome. And this is part of the way, we're on a way to try to sort of decipher how this enormous range of different RNAs interact with these complexes in different ways through threading or, or direct access to the different sites of the nuclease, nuclease sites. We've known from the very start, or almost the start, that the exosome needs cofactors. When you purify it in vitro, it's got very little activity. And so it needs these cofactors. And there are nuclear and cytoplasmic cofactors. There's a considerable number of them. But for the talk I'm going to give today, or so we get into the more experimentally part bits of the talk, there are two cofactor complexes that are directly relevant. One was called the nuclear uh, the nerd nab same, which are called the NNS complex. And this is a transcription termination complex. That it can stop RNA polymerase II transcription, and it also targets the truncated RNAs for degradation by the exosome. 
And the other complex when we talk about is called the TRAMP complex, the TRF45, AIR12, MTR4, polydenylation complex. Um, there are, it comes in two major flavors. Uh, and, for, and for aficionados, this is now, um, they're, they're called TRAMP4 and 5, which have either got a TRF4 or TRF5. Um, and although there's considerable redundancy genetically, these two forms of the complex actually have almost entirely non-overlapping sets of substrates, and I'll mention more about this later on. The, the sort of general way this complex works is that it uh, binds target RNAs in the nucleus. Then the polypolymerases, these are non-canonical polypolymerases, TRF4 or TRF5, put a little oligo A tail onto the substrate. And then an RNA helicase called MTR4 kind of stuffs the free end of the, um, of the RNA with this little unstructured A tail leading into the lumen of the exosome for degradation. And so a consequence of this is that in yeast, and to some extent in human cells, and, and another are eukaryotes, an oligo A tail is a hallmark of an RNA which has been identified and which has been seen by the nuclear surveillance machinery. So these little A tails, typically they're um, two or three, four nucleotides long. If you see those on, on an RNA, and they're short enough to show up in RNA sequencing, it's an RNA, you know that the RNA has been tagged by the nuclear surveillance mach machinery, and it's on its way to degradation. This raises an interesting evolutionary uh, point. So the, this role of nuclear oligoadenylation in targeting RNAs for rapid degradation is obviously really different from the role of cytoplasmic ATLs in stabilizing RNAs and promoting translation. But in bacteria, adenylation also takes place. But in bacteria, adenylation is only associated with RNA degradation. It provides a single-stranded landing pad that allows 3' exonuclease to get going, particularly on structured RNAs. An RNA of a base paired 3' end is almost completely inaccessible to 3' exonucleases. Uh, in E. coli, RNA PMPase is structurally related to the exosome, and it functions together with PAP polypolymerase in RNA degradation. This is obviously analogous to the tra eukaryotic tramp exosome system, both in terms of structure and actually how it works. Um, and so it looks like the ancestral role for polydenylation lay in promoting RNA degradation, and that's been conserved from bacteria through archaea and into the uh, eukaryotic nucleus. But then after the um, evolution of the nuclear envelope, um, eukaryotes like peas and humans and yeast acquired a new function for poly A tails in the cytoplasm in RNA stabil stabilization. So, so, the, so the cytoplasmic mRNA function, tail function is, is actually the opposite of its ancestral function. So, on to some RNA biology. So eukaryotes contain huge numbers of different kinds of RNA. And they have features in common. And the features that are most relevant to this talk are the fact that every one of these species and many other species that don't fit on the, gra on, on the cartoon are generated by post-transcriptional processing. None of these RNAs have a promoter at one end and a terminator at the other that will generate the mature functional RNA. So RNA processing is really ubiquitous. RNA degradation is also very ubiquitous. Cytoplasmic mRNA turnover it is a key factor in the regulation of gene expression. Human mRNAs differ by about three orders of magnitude in their lifetimes. And that obviously has an enormous effect on the, the duration and the amount of protein synthesis you get from an mRNA transcription event. But in addition, all classes of RNA that have been studied are subject to active surveillance pathways, active quality control systems. And the exosome and its cofactors function in the processing or degradation of all of these RNA species. And so in, sort of in consequence of this, my lab has found itself working on a huge range of different topics, but they're all kind of linked by this idea that it's quality control functions on them, RNA processing functions on them. And one long-standing question that we've been working on for 20 years or something is the basic question of how defective and normal RNA protein complexes are actually distinguished in vivo. So the classes that we're going to talk about first, or actually mainly for, for the next bit, are the so-called long non-coding RNAs. 
Um, so the term non-coding RNAs is, is a bit misleading. I actually, when it was first mooted, wasn't a fan of it. There was, it was, a, it was, a, it was a poll was circulated in the RNA community. I voted against it, but I was probably wrong. But the, so all non-coding RNAs are, are, are an amalgam of all RNAs that aren't messenger RNAs or any of the named RNAs on this slide. <laughs> okay? So it's a kind of negative thing, but it's sort of handy as, as a code. And there are lots of them. So yeast, depending on how you count them, has about 10,000 long non-coding RNAs. Long is arbitrarily defined as more than 200 nucleotides, and that's an arbitrary distinction to take out things like pi RNAs and SI RNAs and micro RNAs and the like, and T RNAs. Um, there's reports that in human cells, there are 150,000 regulated long non-coding RNAs. But they're you know, broadly similar in size to messenger RNAs. They have caps. Some of these have poly E tails or pol 2 transcripts in general. But mRNAs are stable and exported and translated, whereas non long non-coding RNAs are, are generally nuclear retained and rapidly degraded, uh, at least in part, or let's say predominantly, by the tramp exosome system in yeast. And so the question we've been interested in for, for quite a while is how long non-coding RNAs are distinguished from messenger RNAs and targeted for degradation. And this is a really tricky thing to think about because there's, all, there's a whole range of different RNAs we're talking about here now. So, you know, 10 years ago, people thought about genes as transcribing products. That would, for a messenger RNA, for protein coding genes, that would be a messenger RNA or P-messenger RNA, or structural RNA genes, would be a tRNA or ribosomal RNA. And so you'd have a gene, it would make a product. But then things started to get um, complicated when people started doing deep sequencing. So various fragments of genes started to turn up. The promoter regions of yeast and human genes are associated with divergent transcripts. So... Um, human, eukaryotic promoters appear to be intrinsically bidirectional, so you nearly always get an, upsense, an upstream transcript. In some cases, this is an actual gene. But in most cases, it's a non-coding RNA that's generated. And as I'll show you in a, in a little bit, also, there are short non-coding RNAs generated in the sense orientation, again, both in yeast and human cells. Um, enhancer RNAs have been uh, linked to function. Exactly why enhancers are transcribed is unclear at present, but there's a strong link between transcription of enhancers and their function. And so exactly why enhancers need to be transcribed is not clear, but transcribe they are into short, relatively short, long non coding RNAs, if you see what I mean. Um, and then there are antisense RNAs transcribed all over the place. So I'll show you a little bit of data, Ellen. Long in yeast, three prime short, three prime non-coding RNAs are very, very common. Long antisense non-coding RNAs are much less common, but have been identified as, as being important for regulation in many systems, including you know, vernalization in pea plants and such like. Um, and they can either run through the gene and, and change its chromatin structure, or they can run right the way through and into the promoter and, and, and function in promoter attenuation. There are uh, transcripts from the 3' UTRs, particularly these are not common in yeast, but are quite common in human cells, potentially regulatory, because they, the they express just the 3' part of the, of the mRNA, which very frequently carries the translation uh, regulation information. And then, then there's a whole host of intergenic long non coding RNAs. These are the ones that there's 150,000 reported in humans, several, uh, many thousands in yeast. In, in humans, they're generically known as link RNAs, long intergenic non coding RNAs. In yeast, depending on who found them under what circumstances, they've had a, a variety of different names, such as cuts and suts and zuts. Um, which, and, and, and highly confusingly, in each of those names, the people originally discovered them, the U has a diff, means a different word. <laughs> but with, so we're not going to that. <laughs> yeah, people have a real trouble getting their head around that one. Um, plus, there's pervasive transcription. And it's been, you know, it's been suggested, um, by Kevin Stroud, I think, was the first one to suggest this, that actually... The, the noise of transcription in, in, a, in a large genome like a human genome will far outweigh all the actual transcription. Just on thermodynamic grounds, you have two billion nucleotides with any kind of reasonable signal-to-noise ratio you can achieve in a biological system. Random transcription will be much more common than actual transcription at, at a few tens of thousands of genes. 
And so there, there, there's, there's, promoter, there's transcription happening all over the place, but at very, very low levels and very dispersed. So these guys and 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 these guys are all being degraded all the time by the surveillance machinery. So they're talking about tens, hundreds of thousands of RNAs, and they have nothing in common that's obvious. So how does the surveillance machinery recognize them? So we've been thinking about this for a while. And, and obviously, the first thing we did was to look at, in, in yeast, we looked to see, well, are there features that would be obviously a marker, you know, the sign of death, that would, do, that would say, eat me, on a small non-coding RNA, and would be with absent on protein-coding genes. I mean, what, would, what, would, what would be the marker for an RNA that should be degraded? Um, and there was nothing really that, that could be the feature. We couldn't find one. And what we speculated was that mRNAs and long non-coding RNAs start off on the same pathway, and at some point they diverge. So, um, and so of all, the, of all these different nut, zut, cut type RNAs, we're going to talk about the cuts just for simplicity. These are the cryptic unstable transcripts. Um, they were the first major non-coding RNA class to be identified in, in yeast and the same time as the prompts in humans, which are probably the same. Uh, they're, they're, and they're carried out by the fact they're very hard to identify in wild type cells. But if you knock out the exosome or the NNS or the TRAMP complex, now they're much easier to detect. So what we did was, a, in principle, a relatively straightforward project. I say we, I mean Alex Tuck, who was a, a PhD student, fantastic student now in the FMI in, in Basel, um, would do was to take 13 factors along the mRNA um, pathway, so from cap binding, elongation, cleavage and polydenylation, export, and then cytoplasmic translation, and then cytoplasmic turnover and nuclear surveillance. And to cut a long story short... It, it emerged that um, three prime end formation was a key distinguishing feature, or a key feature that was different between both um, unstable and stable um, nuclear, nuclear non-coding RNAs and mRNAs. So, stable nuclear, relatively stable nuclear non-coding RNAs and mRNAs have a cleavage and polydenylation site, much exactly the same consensus, whereas the unstable ones don't. And they were also highly depleted. Uh, for the major export factors. So this kind of made sort of sense. So they were, they were differing in how they were stopping, so they weren't getting poly A tails, fair enough, and they're, and they're not being bound by the surveillance factor. They're not being bound by the export factors, but they are being bound very heavily by the nuclear surveillance factors. So this was sort of interesting, um, and, and we learned lots of other things from these analyses as well. But what our final conclusion was that we kind of knew how the non-coding RNAs were different from ARS and RNAs, but we were much less clear on why they were different. And so we then thought, well, you know, maybe actually we're looking in the wrong place, and we should be looking earlier. Maybe they do differ in their transcription in some way. And so there have been a lot of map experiments that have mapped um, RNA polymerase to transcription. And, and traditionally, it's been done by, by chip chromatin Im immunoprecipitation. You formaldehyde cross-link the, 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 the RNA polymerase um, to the chromatin. You break up the chromatin, and then you either put it on microarrays or sequence it or do RT-PCR on it. And the problem with this is that it's not strength transspecific. You're putting chrom purifying chromatin, there's no way to get transspecificity. And it's also high, very difficult to get really good resolution. So given that a lot of these non-coding RNAs are antisense, sense, uh, sense antisense pairs, uh, and we wanted to look with, with higher resolution, what we did instead was to cross-link the transcribing polymerase to the RNA, and then clone and sequence the RNA fragments uh, and map them to the genome. So now we can map with nucleotide resolution and strand specificity. It's the sort of thing you see. So this is um, the 4,000 most transcribed protein coding genes in yeast, arranged by length, shortest, the longest open reading frames. This is the sense orientation. Here's the antisense orientation for this. And you can see the antisense um, transcripts, the sense transcripts, rather, are kind of wiping the open reading frames free of antisense transcription in general. But there's a little fringe of three prime antisense transcripts all the way down here. And you can't really see it at this resolution. But there's a few cases where you see antisense transcripts running right through the gene. You see, also see um, the 
this clear region here, this is the nucleosome free region in yeast, as in, as in human cells. Promoters are primarily defined by a nucleosome free region, and transcription will initiate right adjacent to the nucleosomes at each end of that region. And you can see this, the, the fringe here, this is the, uh, all the antisense, upstream antisense transcripts from the, those di intrinsically divergent promoters. Um, I mean, yeah, so that three point region here. And they said when we looked at Paul II, we saw that uh, um, on almost all genes, the Paul II signal is substantially higher at the five prime end of the transcript than for the three prime. So either the polymerase is going much more slowly, or there's more of it at the five prime end. We'll come back to that in just a moment. There's another thing that, that, that kind of jumped out when we started looking at the data. Well, jumped out, that we discovered when we were analyzing it. Um, and what we're looking at here is the, is the distribution of RNA polymerase 2 across the entire genome, and it's been zeroed on nucleosome 5 prime boundaries. So the yeast nucleosome um, have been mapped, and, and particularly at the 5 prime regions of uh, protein coding genes, or actually of Paul 2 genes, there's a nucleosome array with 150 nucleotides uh, protected by each nucleosome. Um, when we did this experiment, I expected... Uh, this is a classic. I expected to exactly the opposite result of what we got. So what I expected to see was that the, the nucleosome five prime boundary would occur this upside, this immediately adjacent to this to a peak like this. Because what I thought was happening from literature was the polymerases are going to come along, they're going to reach a nucleosome, the nucleosome will resist the polymerase moving because the polymerase has to rotate the DNA in front of it. The, 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 uh, transcribing polymerase rotates the DNA one revolution for every 10 nucleotides transcribed. So the DNA is spin, being spun by the polymerase, uh, and as it's wrapped around the, um, the nucleosome, it's very, it's very hard to imagine how that works. And so what I thought would happen, the polymerase would come to the nucleosome, the nucleosome would then be remodeled or displaced or so, in some way changed, and the polymerase would move on. What, what we're actually looking at here, this is 150 nucleotide bars across here, is that the, the minima correspond to inter-nucleosome spaces, maxis, maxima to nucleosome centers. So what's happening is that the, the polymerases are speeding into the nucleosomes and slowing down as they go around the nucleosome. And slowing down the, so when they get to the middle of the nucleosome, the dyad center of the nucleosome, they're going there most slowly, and then they're accelerating back out of the nucleosome. And so obviously one conclusion is that the nucleosomes are not... Uh, displaced, they're not fully displaced during transcription, and the polymerase moves slowly around them. Um, so this, you know, this is a nucleosome, this is the DNA. The polymerase is going to run around here, and so by the time it gets to sort of around here, it's going to be going it's more slow, and then as it comes back out again, it's going to start speeding up again. And so this, this is presumably related to the energetic costs of turning the DNA when it's bound to the nucleosome, or, or else moving the DNA off the nucleosome in order so that you can spin it as, as, a, as a nucleosome, as the polymerase moves around. So this is relevant. I'll come back to this again in a minute or two. So we also looked a bit more at that um, funny distribution of the polymerase. Yeah. Why was there more polymerase at the, uh, at the five prime ends of genes than further in? So first of all, it was probably going to go slower. However, um, when we looked in a bit more detail, that doesn't seem to be the case. So this is the exosome active uh, catalytic subunits, the RP44 and RP6. These are the three prime exonucleases of the exosome. Um, and here's the tramp complex. Uh, this is the air 2 air 4 air 4 Air 2 TRF 4 version of it, peaking at the 5 prime end. And here's um, NAB3, the component of the NNS tr transcription termination complex. This, this, this is a complex that arrests RNA polymerase 2 and dissociates the transcript. And all of these are showing sharp peaks in the, the 150 nucleotide 5 prime region of the transcripts. It's not that everything's doing this, because um, here's the other form of the uh, TRAMP complex for TRAMP exome aficionados, and it's depleted. The TRF5, AR1 are depleted at the five prime ends of open reading frames. And the major mRNA export factor, MEX67, is also depleted. So it's just active surveillance factors that are peaking at the five prime end. There's also we took data from the literature. This is data from Alan Jacquier 
published in, in, in uh, 2009. And they mapped this, all the three prime ends of all the transcripts they could identify in exosome mutants. And they showed that, that there was a class of RNAs that showed three prime ends accumulating in the, in the five prime 150 nucleotides of protein coding genes, and they called them S-cuts. So it seems fairly clear what's going on here. Um, yeah, is that on almost all, in fact, actually all yeast protein coding genes, there are two major transcripts. There's an mRNA, and there's a fairly uh, high production of short non-coding RNAs. However, in the wild-type cells, you don't see these because they're being rapidly degraded by the they're being rapidly degraded by the tramp and exosome system. But we can see that they, these RNAs have oligo A tails, showing that they are indeed being seen by the surveillance machinery and turned over. So let's have a look at the polymerase. So it was a classic structure of the polymerase. Here's the, um, the large subunit binary polymerase 2 has two domains. It has a, a large catalytic domain. And then it has this weird free prime extension, 26 uh, copies of, of this heptad repeat. And, and this can be phosphorylated in, at multiple positions in a dynamic way. And this, what this does is phosphorylated CTD forms a platform for the regulated assembly of RNA processing factors. So splicing factors, capping factors, uh, and three prime polyadenylation, cleavage and polyadenylation factors all assemble onto this region of the polymerase, which is attached by a sort of loose, uh, not unstructured linker here. And what this does is it, in a sense, it, it communicates to the RNA processing machinery what's happening at the transcription level. Work by many groups, but particularly Dirk Eich, um, Steve Baratowski and others, showed that, that, that um, there's a set of, of multiple phosphorylations that can take place across here. Classic model is that some of these are high at the start, serine 5, and some are low at the start, serine 2, and then that reverses by the time the polymerase reaches the end. I don't want to go into this in any great detail, but in order to understand what was going on in more detail, we, we applied the RNA cross-linking technique. We cross-linked the polymerase to the nascent transcript, but using antibodies specific for each of the modified forms of the polymerase. So now we can get strand-specific nucleotide resolution data on where the different phosphorylated forms of RNA polymerase 2 are across the entire transcriptome. And what you get is something like this. And so this looks a bit complicated. So here are all the protein coding genes. The mRNAs are ranged from long to short. And here you see the, the, the peaks, depletion of the, of the phosphorylated forms, peaks of the phosphorylated forms. Here's the cut non-coding RNAs. This is a different cut class of non-coding RNAs called the SUTs. When we looked at these, we could see that there were some differences between the non-coding RNAs and the protein coding genes. But it was really hard to make sense of it. It's a real common, increasingly common problem in, in biology now. Yeah, a wild excess of data. Yeah, so we have, you know, we have this high resolution data for thousands of genes, multiple classes of transcripts. How in the world can we make sense of this? And so what we did um, was to turn uh, for help to um, Banan Hun Tu and Guido Sanguinetti, who are in the informatics department, and they're experts in machine, machine learning. And so what they did is they used machine learning to generate what's called a hidden Markov model. And I can explain over a beer to anyone who's interested how a hidden Markov model works. It's actually relatively straightforward and clever. But, um, but we're not going to go into that. You'll be delighted to hear. Um, but what, what, the, what, what that machine learning algorithm does is it takes all of this data and, and it divides it up into a defined number of states. Okay? And so each of the states for the polymerase it defines has a particular pattern of phosphorylation across it. And it then uh, segments the genome into each of these states. So every gene will then have um, you know, actually 20 nucleotide bins. Each 20 nucleotide bin will be, defined, will be assigned to a state. And then you then can then look at the genes and see how do the states change across the average gene. Okay? And so what these states turned out uh, that uh, on protein coding genes, there were initiation states early elongation states and late elongation states that were characterized by particular patterns of CTD phosphorylation. And we don't need to know, discuss exactly what those were back and chat to anyone who's interested. Okay? The initiation states 
are predominantly restricted to the transcription start site proximal regions that show that high surveillance factor binding. What's more, the locations of the state boundary changes correlated, although not perfectly, with nucleosome boundaries. We know the polymerase is grinding its way around the nucleosomes, so it makes sense that there would be some sort of correlation. And so the take-home turned out to be that on your, on, on your standard protein coding gene, the, the polymerase is running through, or around rather, the very first nucleosome, the first 150 nucleotides, in initiation state, mainly initiation state one. Uh, and while it's in this state, the transcripts are prone to NNS mediated termination, and then the truncated RNAs are degraded by the tramp and exosome system. By the time the polymerase has reached the second nucleosome, it's generally translating into, into the early elongation state, and then goes on to the late elongation state. And these elongation states appear to be much more resistant to termination. Um, oh, yeah, I just told you that. Okay. Um, and yeah, and so. The 500, this, this 150 nucleotides, this first nucleosome, roughly speaking, um, the mRNAs are targeted for termination and degradation. On the cut non-coding RNAs, we found that the, the, the polymerase wasn't making that state change. So it was, it was carrying on in the initiation state, and so the transcripts remained prone to NNS-mediated termination, and, and degradation by the tramp and exosome system. And so the non-coding RNA genes predominantly generate transcripts that are terminated not by reaching a polydilation site, but are terminated by NNS and are, that are targeted then to the tramp and exosome system. It's not just, I think, the, the, the phosphorylation of the CTD of the polymerase that makes um, newly initiated transcripts prone to rapid degradation. There's a bunch of other features that are characteristic of initiating RNA polymerase II on protein coding genes. The, that very first nucleosome, but not other nucleosomes generally in yeast, carries H3K4 trimethylation. Um, H3K4 trimethylation has historically been assumed to, to correlate with um, tran active transcription because it's found in actively transcribed genes. However, work from the Borotowski lab indicates that, in fact, this is another factor that can recruit the NNS complex. There's evidence in, in some evidence in yeast and good evidence in humans that exosome the surveillance factors bind to the cap binding complex, the, the characteristic, uh, the most characteristic component of initiating RNA polymerase II transcripts. And we have evidence that the histomethyltransferase set one binds to nascent transcripts at the five prime end. Uh, and um, there's lots of evidence in yeast that set one functions in gene silencing, though again, it's always been assumed to be an activating factor. And it binds particularly well to non-coding RNAs whose degradation has been previously shown by ourselves and others to require set one for active degradation. So the model is that initiating RNA polymerase II is actually surveillance ready. Everything about the initiating transcript says eat me. Non-coding RNAs don't need to be specifically recognized by the degradation system. And in fact, had we thought about it probably from the first start, we'd have realized that actually it could never be that way. We know that non-coding RNAs evolve particularly quickly. And there's no way that protein-based a recognition system could ever evolve fast enough to keep track of the rapidly changing non-coding RNA population. So non-coding degradation is actually the default state, and RNA stable RNAs have to actually escape from that. And, and in the case of mRNAs, lots don't. Um, and the, yeah, the, the similar non-coding RNAs are found in human uh, transcripts, uh, transcription start sites. They're called TSSA RNAs or TI RNAs. There's a paper saying that um, their, their stabilization correlates with poor cancer pro prognosis. Make of that what you will. Um, there are short exosome-sensitive uh, non-coding RNAs are generated from, from all human enhancer elements. And so those, I think, are probably the, the closest, actually, human RNAs to the cut class, I suspect. Um, so this has changed our view of how um, the, the RNA surveillance machinery interacts with protein coding genes. We had previously thought that protein coding genes would not be seen by the surveillance machinery because they're not defective. But now that it looks like the, the, the surveillance machinery is looking at all transcript, it seems much more likely that the surveillance machinery would participate in regulation of gene expression.
Um, and it also seems likely that we would see these changes most readily, as role most readily, under conditions in which the cell is rapidly reprogramming gene expression. And so that would be, in human cells, that would be gene differentiation, for example. Um, in yeast, we'd previously shown that nuclear surveillance activities are different on following glucose withdrawal. And so we looked at this again. It's great when you go back to old experiments. Um, and so we looked at the role of um, the nuclear surveillance machinery in reprogramming gene expression. We did an absolute classic yeast experiment. Um, yeast normally grows um, anaerobically, even in the presence of oxygen, if it has glucose as a carbon source. It's really clever. So it, it, it ferments the glucose to carbon dioxide and ethanol. It depletes the glucose very, very rapidly from the growth medium. And the ethanol kills most other microorganisms. The yeast then switches the metabolism around completely and, and grows uh, aerobically using the ethanol as carbon source. And that shift is called dioxic shift. It's been known since the, the 1900s. 1800s. Um, wrong century. And so I'm going to go through this in any detail. Um, it, 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 we did a whole bunch of experiments with RNA seq Paul II occupancy, NUCAT binding, and binding of NNS and TRAMP complexes. And I'm going to cut directly to the conclusions. Um, so, on glucose uh, medium, the so cells are growing happily. On most uh, genes that are involved in growth, like some synthesis genes, um, genes of intermediate metabolism, all that kind of stuff, you have this classic pattern we've been looking at. So, we have the high binding of the NNS tramp and the exosome at the very five prime end of the transcript, but most polymerase make it out of there and live happy and productive lives synthesizing the messenger RNA. On, on growth related genes following nutrient downshift, we see suddenly a large increase in binding of NNS tramp and the exosome across the body of genes. Okay? And what we think is happening is that, that um, these genes, these, these transcripts have now been identified as surveillance targets um, and being, down, being transcriptionally terminated and targeted for degradation. It's a way to rapidly shut off gene expression. Conversely, about a third of the genes are, are being upregulated after glucose withdrawal. These are mainly so-called stress response genes, but also include um, all the, the glycolytic enzymes and other uh, genes that you wouldn't necessarily expect to be uh, strongly upregulated. And a very common pattern in these, and, and among, most of the most ex strongly upregulated genes have this pattern. On glucose, they have strong binding of RNA polymerase II and the surveillance factors, sometimes very strong binding, Upstream of the five prime of the, of the five, well upstream in, in this up 200 nucleotides upstream of the start the open reading frame. But difficult to explain what I'm upstream in here is. When you switch to um, when you take away the glucose, you lose that binding of the, um, the the surveillance factors upstream of the gene, and now you see very strong transcriptional upregulation of the gene. And so what's happening, we think, is that a non-coding RNA is being transcribed through the five prime flanking region of the gene, and that's suppressing expression of the protein coding gene. And when you lose that, you suddenly see these genes are upregulated, and suddenly this transcription upregulation can be 30 and 40 fold. It's really dramatic upregulation. And so the conclusion is that the nuclear surveillance system and non-coding RNAs participate in rapidly remodeling the transcript. And we're talking here about the first you know, four minutes or so after nutrient shift. And so you get both, and, and, and the surveillance machinery fun functions in both downregulation and upregulation of genes and these systems for the whole gene, whole gene expression patterns being reprogrammed. The last bit of the talk is something that, we're, and that, that, that was published about three or four weeks ago in Cell. Um, the last part of the talk is, is, is um, something I found myself working on. Um, this is on co-transcriptional pre-mRNA splicing. For years, I avoided working on splicing and on transcription because both fields are pretty competitive and there's really good people working on it. They don't, even, don't need more. And there's lots of, you know, lots of corners of RNA biology that are much less competitive. But I, you know, the, the wonders of yeast genetics has led me into uh, working on this. So this is a, a kind of generic cartoon of a um, yeast PMR. The yeast genes have mainly got one intron. Uh, and so here's, here it's been transcribed by the polymerase. 
Uh, the CTD binds the splicing machinery uh, and, and the intron is spliced. Most splicing in yeast, as in human cells, is co-transcriptional, and then the polymerase moves off. Um, and the phosphorylation of the CTD um, links the regulation of, of, of RNA processing to the transcription uh, cycle. But there's work from um, Carla Neugebauer and Jean Beggs had shown that um, on splicing competent transcripts, the elongation tends to slow in a splicing-dependent manner. And so the question is, what links the regulation of transcription elongation to RNA processing? So the Paul 2 ctd does it from transcription to processing. What provides the other half of that loop, connecting transcription to, to, to transcription, connecting splicing to uh, transcription? And there's no evidence that this would be involved the CTD phosphorylation, at least not much. And so, fairly briefly, so we did a, a, a genome-wide synthetic lethal screen. We were looking for new exosome components, exosome cofactors. The idea was that we, if you mutate exosome cofactors and then ask for, for uh, other mutations that are synergistically negative with them, you'll get new factors. It sort of worked. We got, we got some we got an interesting factor. But the top hits were two proteins called BRI5 and UBP3. They were known to form a heterodimer, but U3, UBP3 is a ubiquitin protease, which is not what we were expecting. BRI5 had a potential RRM, and we confirmed that the RRM functions in RNA binding in vivo. Uh, previous work from the Svestrup lab had shown that RNA polymerase 2 that's irreversibly stalled at sites of DNA damage, UV and G's crosslinks, can be de -ubiqu are ubiquitated and are deubiquitated by this ubiquitin protease. And before that, um, Danish Mozed, way back, had shown that they were implicated in subtelomeric transcription silence. Well, the silencing of sub expression of subtelomeric genes, initial transcription silencing. So we look to see where BRI5 is. It's the RNA binding component. It's briefly it's depleted at five prime ends. It's strongly enriched upstream of poly A sites, and it's enriched uh, at three prime splice sites. Um, yeah, the splicing pausing. And so we wondered whether the, this ubiquitin protease complex might be involved in linking splicing to Paul2 elongation. On a reporter construct. Um, this is a well type uh, stream. This is a, a splicing reporter. This accumulation of the spliced messenger RNA, loss of B5 strongly reduced the production of spliced product in the reporter, and it also affected elongation on this reporter. Um, and, and actually, that was done by chip analysis. So we'll go back to get Paul 2 again. So here's Paul 2. Here's the active site. DNA comes in here. This is the CTD connected up around here somewhere. Um, we asked where the ubiquitation was that was affected by B5 and UBP3. And it turned out to be here. Uh, it's actually in an unstructured acidic loop that isn't present in, in the structure, but it's at, it's at um, LICE 1246, and here's PRO 1245. So it's just going to be just around here somewhere. So if we, if we sort of cartoon in ubiquitin at the same scale, um, it's fairly easy to see why it might make a bit of a nuisance of itself in this position. Um, so we made a ubiquitin-resistant mutant by, by this lies to arch mutation. And we expressed that in yeast. So what you're looking at here is no, in purple, Paul 2 that can't be ubiquitilated, and in green, Paul 2 that is ubiquitilated. Okay? If Paul 2 elongation, well, I'm sorry, and these are both expressed relative to total Paul 2. So if Paul 2 ubiquitation is, is affecting elongation, we expect to see a reciprocal relationship between these. Okay? So the, the, the unubiquitilatable mutant should have the opposite effect on Paul 2 density to the ubiquitilated Paul 2. Anyway, and that's what you see. So here's, here's the um, ubiquitous Paul 2, and here's unubiquitilatable Paul 2. So ubiquitated Paul 2 is enriched upstream of poly A sites, as BRI5 was, uh, and the, and the, and the, and the non-ubiquitated mutant is depleted at the same position. They have the reverse downstream of the poly A site. And we see the same at splice sites, three-bound splice sites. The, the 
uh, peak of ubiquity Paul II at the three-prime spice site, depleting, depletion of the unubiquitous lethable mutant. Hard to say. So this supports the function of the Paul II ubiquitation and slowing elongation. So conclusion, oh, and so we, so we want to look for effects on co-transcriptional splicing. The model, of course, is that Paul II is slowed in order to promote co-transcriptional splicing. And we've done quite a lot of analysis. Here's just one curve. What we're looking at here is unspliced but poly plus RNA. So this is transcription units where the polymerase has reached the poly A site and the RNA has been cleaved and polyadenylated without having been spliced. Uh, and we see that, the, and, and above the line is increased in that level. And for every gene, every splice gene for which you have decent sequence data, we see a decreased co transcriptional splicing in the Paul II mutant that can't be ubiquitated. So the model is that splicing associated transcription pausing involving ubiquitation of Paul II close to the DNA entry site slows the polymerase and favors co transcriptional splicing. So the model is so you get the polymerase running along. It stalls um, in, in response to splicing and is ubiquitated. It probably involves a splicing factor called PRP45. Um, you then, if the polymerase has a uh, nascent transcript, Bre5 binds to, uh, after splicing predominantly, and, and, de and, and UBP3 deubiquitates the polymerase, and off it goes. And conclusions. Okay. So, you, so RNA surveillance and degradation, we think, are default states for RNA polymerase II transcripts, and this allows huge numbers of very diverse non-coding RNAs to be rapidly, constantly cleared by the surveillance systems. The nuclear surveillance system actively participates in rapidly remodeling gene expression, aiding, up, aiding both up and down regulation. Um, RNA polymerase II CGD phosphorylation links RNA processing to transcriptional events, and we think that ubiquitation and deubiquitation near the active site links transcription to RNA processing. And finally, nuclear surveillance factors bind all classes of nascent transcripts. I haven't talked about Paul 3 or Paul 1, but they're the nascent the transcripts that are also bound by, by the surveillance machinery. Paul 1 and Paul 3 are both ubiquitated, and in each case we have evidence that that's linked to um, elongation. So these are common features across the transcript, all transcription units. And the work was done by, so work on um, the B5 was started by uh, Laura Milligan. Um, informatics was done by uh, Van Anton Thu and Guido Sanguinetti. Uh, work on uh, the nutrient shift experiments was done by uh, Stéphane Bresson uh, and the Camille CEO helped uh, in, in the, um, the UBP3, V5, uh, the bioinformatics part of it. Liz Pifasi, my technician, helps with everything. Hiles, our bioinformatician, helps with the pipelines. And these fine organizations paid for it. And I thank you for your attention. Um, one answer, I think, is that they, they can't help themselves. So all the evidence is that, that eukaryotic cells are not very good at transcription regulation. Y human cells are, are crap at it. Um, transcription is noisy. It, you, know, you, you get bursting. Um, you, get, um, you, you get into cell-to-cell -cell variation is huge. Um, but there's also, a, there's also a big cost. If you, so you have a, a genome with... Um, four billion nucleotides in it. And you want to transcribe 10,000 genes or whatever, 100,000 genes, even being generous, whatever you want to do. And not to transcribe at a thousand times more sites. That, there's a huge energetic cost in kind of that kind of specificity. There's an enormous entropic cost in, in very high specificity in biological systems. And I think it's simply much cheaper to not rely on having a high specificity. Eukaryotic cells in general uh, rely on strength and depth. The, so the, the system relies on, on having everything being just good enough, but you have layer after layer after layer. And so you know, if, if, the, if the 
nuclear transcription machine, a nuclear surveillance machinery doesn't get it, those RNAs will go to the cytoplasm. But there's, cy but there's degradation systems in the cytoplasm are not as active, but they will get them eventually. And the whole system relies on strength and depth, and it's just not worth the effort of trying to control it. It's also the case that, that transcription and turnover is relatively cheap. The energetic cost of, of making and degrading RNA, uh, degrading RNA is almost free. Uh, in, in marked contrast to, to the proteasome degrading proteins, which is enormously expensive. Um, all you need is a couple of, a couple of high energy phosphates and you, you're, ready, you're good to go again. So it, it, it's, it's a relatively cheap activity to make and degrade it. it, it but it's also the case that, that multicellular eukaryotes do not obviously seem to be limited by energy. The, the, the all kinds of pathways in, in, in multicellular eukaryotes are hugely energy inefficient. As you stand there, the amount of energy you're burning to keep your body temperature up dwarfs you know, the amount of energy we're talking about here in, in making degrading RNA. And so that, that efficiency argument just doesn't seem to be a major selective pressure in eukaryotes. And unlike you know, bacteria, for example, where that is a factor. I completely agree with the importance of the RNA surveillance, obviously. Uh, ah, but, uh, of course. <laughs> Um, is it really so important? Because is, is, is the expression of the surveillance factors uh, on high enough level? Is it uh, on stoichiometric levels of SD RNA polymerase? Because from our experience, no, they're no. not so highly expressed. You would expect them... No, no, they don't, they don't. There's no evidence that the surveillance machine rides shotgun on the polymerase. So the, 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 they, they, have to, they have to work enzymatically um, they don't, I don't think they work stoichiometrically. Although, that's a difficult one to say because, of course, the number, uh, uh, the number of polymerases is the uh, number of active transcribing polymerases is the number across the entire transcriptome. The number of the, the polymerases that are present in that very short window is, of course, only a tiny fraction of that. But I don't think, but I don't think they ride shotgun on the polymerase. There's very little evidence for stable binding of the surveillance machinery to the, to the um, polymerase. So I don't think that they're, they're traveling with the polymerase to a large extent. So I think they come in, do their thing, and go. And the second question, uh, during the deoxic shift, what's your hypothesis about uh, how the surveillance machinery distinguishes then up in the deoxic uh, shift? The, the, the big question, so we don't know the answer to that. So the, the NNS complex changes its binding sites radically. Basically, it, 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 it be, it's depleted uh, some of the, a lot of the sites, the five frame end where it was binding before, and it hugely increases its binding at sites down across the transcriptome. But the consensus, if you, so if you, if you look at the binding sites at the nucleotide level, the, the binding site consensus hasn't been altered. And so either the, the um, NNS complex is being changed, so it's known to be phosphorylated, um, or the other factors that would occlude those sites are being changed so things are becoming more available. Uh, and so we're doing, and so the, it, it, because of this in yeast, the, the, those, the glucose sensing pathways are actually quite well understood. And so we said, okay, it should be quite straightforward to knock out the glucose sensing pathways. Some of them are essential, but you can get around that. Um, and so we can completely or almost completely abolish the transcriptional regulation of, 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 of the change in transcript, POL2 transcription. Um, and at least on some transcripts, we see almost completely unchanged, we see exactly the same change in, in NNS binding when transcription levels haven't altered. And so NNS is binding to those sites independently of the changes in transcription. And so this is, this is quite a, a strong, so it, it, it really is seeing those sites now that it couldn't see, even though the RNA sequence is the same. Unfortunately, so we've, we've found that, that so that, that the main, actually, that's, that's, that's on the main glucose signaling pathway that changes the transcription. And the TOR pathway, it turns out, affects the binding, I haven't shown, talked about this, the binding of, of the surveillance machine at the very three prime end. But we haven't managed to find the pathway that regulates NNS relocation, curses. Uh, and so, and it's, it's not a word, because we've, we've done the three major glucose signaling pathways. There are a number of other glucose signaling pathways that were thought to be might well, are reported to be minor. So we'll have to work through those. But it's unlikely 
that, that, that it, 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 given how much work has gone to glucose signaling yeast, it's unlikely that we won't be able to find what pathway it is, but we don't know at present. But the guess is it's changes in phosphorylation of NNS. But what that actually then lets it do, we don't know. The other obvious possibility is that it's, that it's something to do with changes in the polymerase, either the kinasing of the, or, or changes in the modification of the nucleosomes. Um, and so we'll, those are testable. Maybe two questions. So one, uh, are you trying to look for a maybe ubiquitin binding protein that would be, you know, helping stalling the RNA polymerase? Because that's maybe an obvious thing which will help the whole... So, so the answer is that we, that we haven't looked for it. But, and, and, and the biggest thing that we don't know is actually is the ubiquitin ligase. Mm -hmm. So Svestru reported it was a protein called RSP5, which, which is a ubiquitin ligase that turns up everywhere. And, and for RNA polymerase 1, we're almost certain it is RSP5, but it doesn't look like it's RSP5 for Paul 2. The caveat is RSP5 is essential, so you can only use conditional mutants, so it always sounds a little bit dubious. And one would assume that this is DNA damage induced as well, not only maybe on the... So, we, so, so the, the DNA damage... So Svestrup's lab reported the ubiquitination site that they thought was responsible for the DNA damage response, and it's a different site. It's a completely different part of the protein. It's on the other side of the protein. So it looks like although the polymerase can be ubiquitated in response to DNA damage and in response to splicing, it's not the same ubiquitation event. And the second question would be more to surveillance and, and remodeling. I mean, this, if you could comment this, you know, uh, so perhaps as a starvation of the yeast, you, you drive the cells to meiosis. And this is perhaps something which, which reminiscent of the way how the methylation mm -hmm. pattern, you know, a, Histone H3K4 trimethylation, it's, it's the exact mark where the double strand breaks are being made. Now there are evidences that the different transcription and role of RNA actually in the formation and response of the cells to double strand breaks. So any idea how whether this is linked together or it's a consequence? So, so so that, and, and, and the role of RNA at double strand breaks, I think it's a fantastic and fascinating subject, but it's not, I don't think it's relevant here. Um, I'm too close to the speaker. Um, I probably didn't stress this enough. So, the, 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 so yeast response, the transcriptional responses to, to starvation or, or glucose withdrawal have been studied for generations almost. Um, but they've not only been studied on this sort of time scale, uh, our time scales. We're actually looking at minute time scales. So these, these are four minute, eight minute time points. So the, the, you know, the, this is the immediate first response we're looking at when the cell's really switching things around. Much later you get other responses, to, including meiosis, if, if, if you starve the cells. These are all haploids, they want to go meiosis. But, uh... Any other questions? Okay, if we have not, thank you again, David. And, yep. uh... I'd, I'd like to present you with the Mendel lecture. <laughs> Sorry, a medal for oh, your lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you.